Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Charles Derber. He's the author of more than 15 books and is considered one of today's leading public intellectuals. He's been called an intellectual heir to C. Wright Mills. So thank you so much for your work, and thank you for being on the program. Thank you, Derek. Really nice to be with you. So my first question is, um, tell me about your most recent book, and also tell me what, what is a sociopathic society? Okay, well, that is the name of the book, Sociopathic Society, and it's subtitled A People's Sociology of the United States, which is a tip to my, nod of the head to my very dear friend Howard Zinn, who died a couple of years ago, but wrote a book called The People's History of the United States. Um, in any case, what I try to do in this book is um, make clear, it's interesting that social scientists have not really talked about sociopathic society. The, the idea, both in the university and in, the, in American society, is that it's a psychological um, illness, you know, a psychiatric category. And there is something either biologically wrong with the brain of, such a, of a sociopathic individual, or uh, it's simply a failure of socialization. In other words, a, sociop a sociopathic person and the idea of sociopathy in America always refers to an individual rather than to a society, um, is that that person has not learned the rules and values of the society, and their sociopathy is a reflection of a failure to do so. So what I do in the book is try to make the case that um, by restricting the idea of sociopathy to an individual uh, and treating it as a psychiatric condition, um, I, we're, we're losing the really useful kernel of the idea. And that is, uh, and this is what the book tries to argue, that um, the most important forms of sociopathy have to do with the uh, rules and culture and economic systems of a society itself. And that a sociopathic society really explains um, the prevalence of sociopathic individuals. Um, but they're, and I mean, I, when I talk about sociopathic societies, I'm not being metaphorical. I'm, I mean literally that a society is engaging in socially, creating social rules which are sociopathic and prescribing uh, behavior that is sociopathic. And that most of the behavior that sociopaths, individual sociopaths take on, first of all, is less significant. It's terrible when, you know, it can be shooting somebody or it can be, um, you know, abusing um, somebody in any number of ways, but that the, the most important and devastating forms of sociopathy are institutional. They're corporations, they're military, they're systems like uh, our form of corporate capitalism which essentially operate by sociopathic rules and essentially mandate that large institutions carry out sociopathic um, uh, you know, behavior. So just to be, you know, that's pretty abstract. Let me just be a little bit more concrete. So for example, um, capitalism as a system, which is really at the heart, I think, of, well, let's start with American capitalism and the way it's practiced in the United States something which has become a little bit more legitimate to discuss after the Piketty book, which has essentially shown one aspect. This is the book, Capital in the 21st Century, that has become such a huge bestseller. And in that book, Piketty shows that extreme inequality, that is um, you know, a system in which 0.1% of the population, a few thousand families, basically absorb most of the wealth of the society that's created today in, in the United States. And that increasingly, m most other people in the society will, can expect to do very poorly and will suffer in many social and economic ways. And he shows that this is not a sign of the market functioning abnormally or uh, you know what it's not what economists call a market imperfection it's a sign of the capital markets operating uh, perfectly um, and extreme inequality has been endemic to three centuries of capitalism and uh, with the exception of a short period in the 
in the uh, mid 20th century. So um, in the United States, um, when a lot of capital was or wealth was destroyed by wars and the depression, and where the New Deal helped uh, ameliorate some of the sociopathic uh, policies that were making so many workers suffer. So in any case, my argument. Uh, is that if you look at the most important institutions in society, corporations, the military, the political elites, and so forth, they are engaged in constructing rules and policies and behavior that do enormous damage to the great majority of the population and the world and to the planet. And these are not aberrations, rogue actors. They are actors who are acting precisely as the system requires them to do. Um, one just small example of that uh, is, for example, Walmart, which is the largest employer in the world, um, also pays some of the lowest wages of any American company. For example, it, it pays substantially lower wages than its competitor, Costco. But um, in doing so, you might say that by paying people, I think the Walmart average is a little above minimum wage. It's about eight and a quarter or something, eight, an hour. Um, and it keeps many of its workers, of course, at um, part-time status so they can't get health care and other benefits. Um, that is something that actually, it's not a sign of um, excessively sociopathic individuals or personalities at the head of Walmart. It's a corporate strategy, which is a considered the most, you know, uh, sophisticated and um, almost mandated because if a company seeks to benefit its workers um, at the cost of profit, um, it, the, the directors of the corporation can be sued for violating their fiduciary obligation, which is exclusively to their shareholders. So any corporation that seeks to protect workers or the environment at the expense of profit is violating its fiduciary obligations to its shareholders. Um, so uh, what we're seeing in, you know, I mean, if you think about what our plight in the current era is, we're seeing an age, you know, the most sociopathic uh, catastrophe of our age is climate change. And climate change is a simply a symptom of the sociopathic character of our of our economy and our, our capitalist model. Because, and, and I'll, I'll stop this, but I, I just wanted to make clear this one way. The reason for that is, think about what a sociopathic person does. In psychiatric terms, a sociopathic person is somebody who is quite prepared to do harm to other people uh, and who doesn't feel any regret or remorse in doing so. Psychiatrically, they're seen as people who are emotionally disassociated and therefore are perfectly capable of doing terrible things to other people um, without feeling any pain. Um, now, capitalism produces exactly this kind of institutional model of behavior among corporations. And let me just explain why. Basically, corporations are programmed to feel nothing. Of course, corporations are not people, contrary to the Supreme Court's recent decisions in McCutcheon and Citizens United. But corporations are programmed to essentially, and mandated by, by corporate charters, to maximize profit um, at the expense of uh, whatever damage might be done to the environment or to workers. And I just want to go into this a little bit more. The, the way in which this is like a person who does harm and feels nothing about no, no regrets or no pain at doing harm is that the way capitalist markets are structured, they, all of the harm that is carried out in the name of pursuing profit competitively in the market is defined, is really an externality. And an externality is a cost to the company that, is invisible because the cost is not borne by the company. It's borne so that, for example, if a company like Exxon is emitting lots of carbon in the environment or a coal company um, or, you know, selling terrible food or whatever, the costs of that are very real to 
the to the public obviously there are enormous health costs and environmental costs and so forth but if they don't register just as the pain that the individual sociopath does when he shoots somebody or hurts somebody or rapes somebody or whatever um, that pain done by the corporation is systemically unfelt so to speak it's it's not it's invisible um, because the market is organized in capitalism in such a way that it doesn't register. It's like a blind market. It can't see or feel uh, the cost that its policies are perpetrating on the general population. And I'll just give you one more example. Globalization, to me, is a grand sociopathic enterprise. Why is it a sociopathic enterprise? Well, it's in the same capitalist sociopathic mandated model, which is, in my judgment, and I write about this in the book, globalization is really an effort to abandon uh, the entire American population and uh, infrastructure because it's, been too, it's become too expensive for American corporations. And they've realized that when they go abroad and produce abroad and sell abroad, that they can do much more, they, they can make much more profit because they're not constrained by rules, uh, the, the very minimal but still you know, modest rules and uh, wage protections and so forth, environmental protections that exist in the United States. So globalization is a strategy for producing what I call surplus people in the United States. Millions and millions of Americans are going to go jobless. We know the long-term jobless rate and so forth. This is, since this is a deliberate corporate strategy um, and it's likely to intensify uh, over, you know, coming decades, you're basically rendering redundant much of the American population, meaning they have no place in the society, which is one of the most, if you, if you create a system in which a large number of people don't have any place, that's about as sociopathic as you can get. And so I think this is built into the DNA of globalization. Of course, in the end, sociopathic people not only do damage to themselves, but I mean to, to others, but they, they can harm themselves. Um, and a sociopathic society in the end can commit sociocide, which is what, of course, climate change is leading to, um, where the pursuit of, um, you know, strategies for profit, which are not felt, by the pursuers because they're, they're not registered by the markets, they're not born by the corporation, um, produces endless consumption and endless carbon, which will ultimately destroy the earth, as I know much of your own work has made very, very clear. And uh, the people doing it sleep very well at night because uh, they're doing what the laws of capitalism mandate and they don't... Um, uh, they have an ob they actually have a legal obligation to pursue maximum return to, to shareholders, whatever the cost to society. So I'm sorry for that long discourse, but I, what I just wanted to basically say is if you think very intuitively about a sociopathic person, the analogy with a sociopathic institution like a corporation in a capitalist society, it's not just an illusion or a metaphor. It's literally the same the same logic of behavior that you you undertake destructive behavior in your own interest uh, and you feel no regret in fact you feel like you're doing exactly what you're expected to do so thank you for that and i th i think it's all um and I, I, you know please don't apologize I, I think it's fantastic and it's very very rich and there are um a bunch of different directions that that I would like to go with that. So I, if, if it's okay with you, I would like to just sort of give some responses for about a minute, and then you can just take them wherever you want. Sure. Absolutely, um, Derek. Okay. So the first, first I want to to thank you for saying that this – I think you said the pattern goes back at least 300 years. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to thank you for not saying that this is merely modern capitalism, but this is capitalism. Because right. that, that – I think a lot of times I, I've read some analyses where people talk about how, you know, the capitalists these days are really terrible, and they seem to forget about J.P. Morgan and they seem to forget about 
that the, the larger systemic problem with capitalism. So I want to thank right. you for not doing that. Um, right. And then the and second, I just want to add, Derek, if uh-huh. I could, that that's one of the, I think, re- things that is beneficial about, I mean, there are many limitations to Thomas Piketty's work, but one of the virtues of it is exactly what you're pointing to, that, and I, that he goes back 300 years in capitalism, it goes back longer than that, but he has data for 300 years, which shows that in regard to inequality, and class divisions, that you're exactly right, that these patterns have been endemic and very consistent over many hundreds of years. So, yes. And and the, the, and thank you. The next thing is that um, yet we consistently hear, well, this, this, this brings up another of your books that I don't, I, di- I didn't know that we were going to talk about and we don't have mm-hmm. to, but the mm-hmm. whole notion of um, just hegemony of discourse and mm-hmm. And how I mean, here's the deal is is frankly, what you're saying seems so damn obvious and mm-hmm. so clear, yet why is this news? I mean why why you know I, this is true with my own analysis. I'm not attacking you in any way, right right, right but it's right. like you know there is some of the analysis I do that I'm embarrassed to actually have to say this. Right. and it's the same here why why is why does anybody even need to write a book? That shows that capitalism is sociopathic. I, I don't, and that that goes back to. And then there's one more thing I want to bring in, and then actually two more things I want to bring in real quickly, and then and then I'll shut up. And one of them is um, Ruth Benedict did this great analysis of why some cultures are really happy and cooperative, and people are generally women are not treated poorly, women are treated well, children are treated well, and some other cultures. Um, women are treated very poorly. Children are treated poorly. People are generally unhappy. The people are the culture is much more warlike. She's trying to figure out why um, the different cultures why there's this distinction. You know, it's, and she figured out it's not race. It's not whether the culture is wealthy or poor. It's not what continent they live on. It's none of that stuff. What she realizes is all about social rules, and basically it has to do with what you reward socially is the behavior you get. And right. so the cultures that re- right. would reward socially beneficial behavior and disallow behavior that benefited the individual, the group, would be cooperative. They would be relatively happy. And the cultures that rewarded behavior that benefits the individual at the expense of the group would – it's just really obvious. It's what you, what you reward socially is what you get. And the way they did that is one of the things had to do with – um, their method of distributing wealth, that if wealth was handled through what she called a funnel system, whereby wealth is constantly funneled from poor to rich, everybody, it's a dog-eat-dog world, which is a phrase I hate. And mm-hmm. if, on the other hand, wealth is constantly siphoned from rich to poor, then everybody's secure because they know they're going to be able to eat tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And then the last thing I want to bring in, and then you can take any of this any direction you want. Okay. The last thing I want to bring in is I love Robert J. Lifton's work. And mm-hmm. He has this great thing about how before you can commit any mass atrocity, you have to convince yourself that what you're doing is actually beneficial. So the Nazis weren't, in their own estimation, actually committing genocide and committing mass murder. They were purifying the Aryan race. And likewise, um, in the United States or or North America, they were never committing genocide and stealing land. They were manifesting their destiny. And we at present or in current capitalists are not oppressing the world. Globalization, oh, for God's sake, Charlie, how could you possibly say that globalization is harmful? For God's sake, what we're doing is we're developing right. those places. Right. We are helping right. them out. Without right. us, how could they right. survive? And so, okay, I'm done. So <laughs> take no, any of that are, any direction these are, you want. These are all really, really important points. So I think a few of them have to do with the issue of um, I, ideology and the way people think. You asked, isn't this all obvious? Well, and, and you also said that don't, didn't the Nazis believe that they were doing good things? And, um, and I think by using that metaphor, you help to answer your own question. Um, societies produce, I should say, the elites of, of societies. And we know that um, you know, in our kind of economy, there, there are very you know, rarefied elites who are not only making a lot of money, but who are buying up universities and media and the all what you know what it's the technical term uh, jargon is is the ideological apparatus, the 
the set of institutions that basically shape how elites and the general population think about the system they're living in. And of course, any system can, I mean, you can, you can reproduce a system with guns and only guns, but that's a very tenuous and expensive way of doing it. So every society puts a lot of energy and resources and takes some of the smartest people in society, like economists today or political theorists, and pays them, pays them well to persuade people that what is, as you say, obviously sociopathic is actually in the interests of the people who are being hurt. So, or, or that the system is operating in a, you know, for example, that the great divisions in capitalism between a small number of wealthy people and a huge number of people who are suffering very badly is due to the, you know, the merit and um, there are there are moochers and looters, as Romney said, and then there are that are takers, as Paul Ryan says, and then there are the makers, the creatives. And this kind of ideology, of course, is this sort of social Darwinist ideology, has been very closely linked to capitalism since the late 19th century, um, and um, and even back further, and you know, to Adam Smith way back with the idea of the invisible hand, that everybody pursuing their own interests. Um, will will benefit the the society as a whole. So, um I think the answer to your question why do you, why do we people like you and me have to write the obvious is that it's not obvious because society puts an enormous amount of um of intellectual firepower into persuading people that this is actually um the best way to promote the general well-being. And um, now, of course, it's not a perfect system, and there are many intellectuals who are critical of the system. But, you know, when you take the mass media, when you look, for example, at American foreign policy and American wars, which is one part of my book, along with climate change and and the basic, you know, economy, um, um, you know, these ideas go back to the founders, the idea that the America was an exceptionalist country, um, and that it, its manifest destiny, as you say, or as a position even earlier, a city on the hill back in the 1600s, the language of the Puritans, was that the the pursuit of empire, really, the word, the language of empire, was used as early as the country was founded. It was that the United States would spread, and this was seen not, I mean, just as the Nazis saw taking over much of the world. Um, as a gift to humanity. I mean, this all is wrapped in the idea of sacrifice, our soldiers and our, you know, as hero, America sacrificing its blood to protect and defend and, and spread democracy. The, the same kind of ideology cloaks the domestic capitalist economy that I was going on about for so long. The The argument is that when that capitalism is um, the most productive, prosperous, efficient system, and the the problems, the the, patho- the pathologies of the system simply reflect differences in the innate uh, worth uh, behind by by talent or hard work and motivation or. Uh, moral character and so forth. So it's a system which is essentially producing outcomes that are in the best, that are fair and meritocratic, and also in the best interest of everybody. Um, so, so my basic argument is that when you're writing about sociopathic societies, you have to realize that you also you you can't just take into account the raw power and brute nature of the sociopathic impacts. You have to look at how the society chooses to interpret them. And the elites are very, very invested in, but this is why ideas are important, uh, because it's everything is a matter of social interpretation. Sociopathic behavior can be redefined, as the Nazis did, as um, cleansing of racial impurity and evil. And so most of the behavior that we were talking about earlier has been redefined by American ideologues as part of an exceptionalist nation that is by globalizing, by 
uh, freeing up, um, you know, wealth to to not have to worry about social and environmental impacts, is all in the service of a good society. And my 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 final thing on this is that, you know, it doesn't totally work. I mean, what I found in doing lots of conversations with, you know, on the radio or TV or or just out in the community with people, many people understand that. I mean, it is sort of obvious to them in some ways, but they don't have a feeling of confidence or legitimacy or um, moral certainty and passion about these things because, you know, they live in, a, as you say, we're saying when you're talking about Ruthenic, they live in a society where there are certain rules and certain authorities and certain um, rewards that are that are being structured and defined in a certain manner and if you live in that society it's very you can't really remove yourself from it you know it's very hard unless you have massive uh countercultures or social movements that are redefining the ideological reality that the elites are propagating it's very hard for ordinary people who have an i think an instinct about many of these things because uh you know, again, if you're being shot, if you're being abused emotionally, shot physically, being harmed in all the ways that we were describing, and you see that in the environment or, you know, in the natural environment or whatever, uh, people are not totally unaware of these things. It's just that they're involved in a continuous inner struggle, I think, to make sense of the world because the official reading of this that they're getting from all of the major institutions that shape our ideas uh, and from the companies that are peddling, let's take food again. again. I mean, in some way, it's very hard for people to know what is that they're eating very uh, environmentally destructive. You know, the way that their food is being produced is, is both unhealthy and, and destructive to the environment. Uh, well, there's a reason that people have so much trouble. It's not that they're stupid. It's that people's ideas are shaped by all of the cultural influences around them. And, and capitalist societies put, an, you know, capitalist culture is perhaps its most important product. You know, they, they, capitalism, any economic system cannot, um, cannot per, you know, persist unless people have been persuaded of its legitimacy. So that's why what appears to be obvious is never obvious. It's simply it's it, it's something that people can intuitively come to feel there's something wrong, but they need to have um, a way, mostly through alternative struggles and communities where people learn, as in the, say, blacks with the civil rights movement. Slavery, was court, of course, in the South, was treated as one of the great moral systems. I mean, it was justified basically on moral grounds. And, um, and then there was no one more moralistic than John Calhoun or the, the southern slave owners who argued that they were taking care of their slaves and their system was better for it. So, I mean, obviously, I think most people would agree that slavery was a sociopathic system in the United States, but it was the most morally elevated. The, the discourse about slavery in the South was probably as intense a moral discourse as any discourse in the United States. So... That's why the obvious is not obvious and why it's very hard um, to to get the obvious um, into even the public conversation. Um, thank you for that. And I, I completely agree. And I'm thinking about um, something that a friend of mine has, and really my sort of environmental mentor, John Osborne, has said a lot, which is that... Um, Lies are very expensive to maintain, which is why they have to be repeated so often. And mm. I'm thinking about how um, there, in so many areas of, I, I experience this all the time, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you do too, that there's, there's oftentimes this huge difference between public and private discourse, by which I mean people sitting around the table will understand these things, but even they themselves, when they go out in public, there is this, um, that their, their discourse can change. Oh, it reminds me of something. Years ago, I was taking my mom to Walmart, and mm. um, you know, it's, it's, I live in a tiny little town. It's like, where are you going to go for your for your prescriptions or whatever? So right, I'm taking her to right. Walmart, and 
I didn't feel like going in the store for whatever reason, so I was going to sit on the sidewalk and just read a book while I wait for her. And this was not a big moral statement. I just didn't feel like going in with all the people. Mm-hmm. And so I sit, I sit on the sidewalk, and the, the, the point I'm, I'm getting at is that um, everybody, who not everybody, but as people walk by, I felt tremendously judged because I was sitting, and I had you know reasonably short hair, and I was dressed reasonably nicely, mm-hmm. but I was sitting in an unauthorized place. Mm-hmm. And there is this tremendous social... I mean, I felt really... I mean, it's like I only sat there for a couple of minutes. And I couldn't handle it. You know, it's like, okay, I'll, I'll go sit on a bench or something. And so the point <laughs> That's is a that, great story, yeah. that there's this well, tremendous... Well, you know, what I, what I ahead, take from that, there's, it's, um, I love that. And, you know, it, again, we've been talking about social norms and how sociopathy can be, is a, is, you know, people respond to the rules and the values and the responses of people around them. And I think that it's terrorizing to be in flagrant violation, either in your ideas or your behavior, in your case, just sitting on the sidewalk where you're supposed to be sitting on a bench or something. And it's, it's reinforced not only by shame and cultural pressure, but of course by fear of, and terror, like in our current economy, of what the consequences are of disagreeing or going up against the dominant ideas. Um, so, for example, just to give you... I mean, I teach out here in Boston and in college, at Boston College, and I find that the students here who tend to come from close to the upper 1% or 10% are generally, can really, they respond very, very openly and, um, you know, they, they really assimilate and engage these ideas and tend to, to agree with them. But they, just like you say, it, it's sort of like, to go out in the, the world and live a counter set of ideas, which challenge, you know, it sort of says this is a sociopathic way of living as against, um, is, is terrifying. It's terrifying because, one, it can lead to marginalization or what you experienced outside of Walmart. I mean, that people are looking at you as totally, you know, um, you know sort of bad or... Or, or dangerous or, or just odd. And so cult, that kind of peer pressure and social pressure is very strong. And then it's reinforced, of course. I mean, people have are, are coping with, for reasons I was saying before, with an incredibly um, tenuous job market. They're worried. Um, I mean, the one period in history, which was when I was a young person in the 60s, we didn't have to worry about not getting a job because there was an unusual... Um, set of circumstances going on in the economy for that period. And so we weren't afraid to act out more of our inner doubts of the kind you were communicating. But, you know, we live in most capitalist eras through history, all the way through history. Um, capitalist job markets have been very, very scary. And if you don't conform, if you don't get along to go along, you know, go along to get along, you're not going to have bread on the table. I mean, what capitalism does is take away people's ability or make it very difficult for people to survive without conforming to the larger rules of a larger system that puts whatever bread they can get on the table. So I think, you know, this is a terrorizing system. It's not just a sociopathic system. It's a system which makes it so... um, terrifying to, to to sort of rise up against it that even very privileged people like my students find, who come to share when they've done some of the reading of the kind of work, my own work or your work or other people who are very, very critical of the way the, the larger system is operating, they, they like, I, like you said, in private, I mean, in their own thinking, they, they know that there, or they feel that there's a great deal of truth to it. But in the way they live their life, they, they they simply don't feel that they can carry out these counter ideas. And, you know, the university plays a very important role here in in kind of promoting some of the ideology that we live in a free society because these ideas can be communicated to some degree. The corporate university with adjunct professors is becoming harder for young faculty to say these things because they won't have jobs if they do. But, I mean, by saying these things, I mean putting forward the analysis that that people like myself and you are doing. But um, it's just so hard for ideas that are critical to be 
internalized in the life and behavior of people. I mean, I mean, universities are very interesting that way today because they're very open places in certain ways and certain ideas that can be very critical. I mean, I've taught in the university for 35, 40 years, and I've been able to keep doing that. But universities are, they, they kind of promote a certain ideology of which itself, as I say in the book, is a little bit sociopathic because it promotes the idea that we do indeed live in a free society since there is a measure of freedom of expression of critical ideas. But the university has been very successful in most historical eras in insulating the transmission of critical ideas when they exist, and they're not all that common in the university, but they exist, but, but resisting the transmission of these critical ideas into the lives of the students. I mean, what universities do is make a very fundamental wall. It's both an emotional and political and, I mean, it's, a, it's an educational philosophy that the life of the mind is to be separated from the life you live. So I, have, I see thousands of students who go out of the university with critical ideas buried deep in their private thinking of the kind of thing, but which are not going to be reflected in the choices they make in their life because it's too terrifying. It's almost impossible to live a life based on these alternative ideas. Now, because of the environmental crisis, um, I think there are certain opportunities. I, I see more and more students and young people who really feel they don't want a car, they don't want to participate in a sociopathic lifestyle, and they're willing to live um, alternative lives that are not going to be highly materialistic because they've, you know, there's a certain kind of environmental awareness in the millennial generation that has made it, you know, it's almost like created that community of, of a counter culture. I wouldn't overemphasize that. It's not, it's not fully developed at all yet, but it provides some possibility for young people or certain certain young people to try to act on these ideas. But, you know, this is the real challenge of our day is, um, is how in a terrifying sociopathic system you can um, create these new ideas which help to catalyze new, new behaviors and put them into, you know, the behavior of a, of a new generation. I mean, the Occupy movement was a hopeful... Um, sort of spark of that, you know, that much as the Arab Spring. I mean, you're seeing much of this abroad as well. So it's not as if people are totally oblivious to what you're calling the obvious or, to, you know, people can make these breakthroughs. But as you see in the Arab Spring, the reactions, the structural options available to them are very, very harsh. And the Arab Spring is leading back to autocracies. Occupy has been... I think Occupy has had a, a lasting effect, but it's been um, demonized or trivialized uh, in the media, and so that much of the younger generation sees it as as frivolous and not serious in promoting, uh, because it wasn't concrete enough in promoting a new way of life. But but there is there is this possibility, you know, America's sociopathic uh, system survives by promoting itself as the exceptional model of freedom and to do so it has to permit a certain measure of freedom and critical thought and it does um, so that a close friend and colleague of mine like Noam Chomsky has been able to you know he'd be shot in many more closed societies he's still alive at age 85 or something and still very very uh, you know has a very wide audience and certainly in much of the world and in parts of the United States so so that those are the the sort of niches and wedges where we want to move to to try to exploit exploit the the margins of of openness that that are available to us. So we have about um, seven or eight minutes left, and um, I guess I have a couple three questions, and okay. one of them is, um, you know, we've been talking about the ability we've been talking about you know the, the 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 I love what you're saying about the the freedom to speak but actually it's um it gives the illusion of freedom mm -hmm. and then and then we've been talking about how people can break away from the sociopathic system and there's there's two things I want to say about that one is when I was maybe 
25, 26, 27, I was in a library, and this book just jumped off the shelf at me. And it was Neil Everenden's book, The Natural Alien. And it was the first book I ever read that did not take the sort of dominant mindset that the world is created for humans to use. It was the first book I ever read that did not take that as a given. Mm -hmm. And I remember standing in the library and a huge weight went off my shoulders and it it, cha it literally changed my life in terms of mm -hmm. I realized in that moment that, no, I'm not crazy. The culture's crazy. It was, it was this right. huge breath of freedom. And so right. one of my questions, and I want to, since we have so little time, I want to do all the questions at once and you can choose how to respond. So okay. the first question is, how did you break free of all this? Mm -hmm. um, next question is... Um, as you've been saying, that we're reliant. What do you do? What does one do when one is has been systematically made dependent upon the very sociopathic system that is exploiting you and everybody else? That you know every every dyna every abusive system from a family abuser. You know what the domestic violence guy does. One of the first things he does is cut cut the victim off from all social contact and cut them off from alternatives. And right. the rules of apartheid were created to force people out of subsistence economies and into the mines. Slavery was dependent upon people not having access to land. You know, everything. It's, this is, what do you do when you made, one of the things I say all the time is, um, one of the reasons we don't defend the land where we live is because when your experience is that your food comes from the grocery store and your water comes from the tap, you'll defend to the death the system that brings those to you, which is right now capitalism. Right. And so we're, we've been made dependent upon it. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is um, what do we do faced with the sociopathic system that is killing the planet? What do, what do, what do listeners of this, of this interview, what do they do? So there, that's, you got, you got, well, those are you got nine minutes, to, yeah. <laughs> nine minutes to solve the whole damn system. No problem. Yeah. So uh, in terms of what, how did I break free? Well, I don't know if I fully broke free. I, I, I think the answer to that was, one, I saw certain things in myself that I wasn't comfortable with. Um, and I, so some of it was a matter of examining myself. And the other thing was that I grew, I was sort of formed in the 60s and 70s when there was a large community of people and, and a robust intellectual community and political movements that were really defining who I was. I mean, I spent every weekend going down, you know, dealing with protesting the war in Vietnam and involved with the civil rights movement. So I, my, I was sort of formed as a person in a community which was challenging these sociopathic, you know, whether it was uh, segregation or Jim Crow laws or, or the Vietnam War and so forth. I think being formed in that, I mean, you described the experience of feeling liberated from you know, where, where you just read that book and a weight was lifted. I think when you're part of a, a you know, really strong and joyful movements that, that have great uh, power in terms of ideas and hope and community, uh, that's an enormously um, liberating and powerful thing. And um, I, I think that is probably, I mean, if I had grown up in the 50s, the more conformist 50s, or in the, after Reagan, my students tell me, you know, they, the defining events in their lives are 9-11 and, um, you know, the Great Recession, I think it would have been very hard for me. And, and somehow, so the historical period was much more, um, you know, enabling of, of having a critical stance toward the society. I think the point you're making about, you know, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. When you're dependent on a sociopathic system, I, I always get the image of the person, you know, to, to make it more personal, not for myself, but for people who might be listening to this. Um, there's a there's a common phrase that ch abused children um, who are being physically or emotionally abused by their parents, if you try to separate them from their parents, will hold on for dear life to their parents. Um, so that even when pe when people are subject to states of extreme abuse, as they do in, as they are in sociopathic systems, um, they hold on. They hold, and it's it's both a feeling of safety because our 
fundamental need is to feel secure and to feel we belong to something. And um, the corporate society, the sociopathic corporate system, does employ us and it does provide us with remarkably exciting toys and technology like our, our phones and our computers. It has a lot of seductive appeal. So, and the cost of breaking away from it is very, very high. Um, I, I actually, what you talked about there in, in my book called Corporation Nation, I write about this in a short chapter, just about biting the hand that feeds you. It's, it's, we become completely dependent on corporations, and therefore the ability. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely right what you say that it's, it's very, very hard to break away from a system, no matter how sociopathic, uh, if your survival depends on it. So then the final question, what to do, um, I can only answer that question, um, well, historically and personally. The, the historical observation, and this takes me back to Howard Zinn, and a pe- you know, I titled, subtitled my book, A People's Sociology of the United States. You know, A People's History of the United States, Howard Zinn, shows that Americans have had, despite all of the long history of sociopathic capitalism in the, in the United States, there's always been um, a robust counter tendency in social movements, whether it's abolitionism or women's movements and so forth, or labor movements. The United States is friendly, not friendly, but it, it permits certain kinds of movements which have had a certain measure of success. And so I think the lesson of what you do is you find the movement of your generation whether it's like a version of environmentalism, you know, radical environmentalism, environmental justice, or, um, you know, immigrant rights. Or, I mean, there, there are many, many hundreds of movements. They're fragmented. They're, um, they're, they're not visible as they should be at the national level. They're certainly not powerful in Washington. But those are the places where people are going to... Um, nurture and develop, sort of, sort of learn to slowly or quickly uh, cut the ties between them and the system on which they're dependent. I've, I've been very moved by seeing seniors going off into the world who they just don't want to, they want to, they don't want to join that sociopathic world and they are desperately trying to figure out how to make a life for themselves where they can survive but don't take part. And they very often want to just, you know, I mean, it's like the counterculture of the 70s, go to Vermont and have your commune. That didn't work out terribly well for people, and they want to be engaged. But they're, they're finding urban villages, and they're finding urban communities where they can survive outside, to some degree outside the system. And they're finding communities of, of movements in which they can, the kind of movements that Howard Zinn wrote about so so inspirationally, um, where they can deal with these environmental and justice issues um, on, on many different levels. You know, personally, I do, I would just say that um, even when you, I mean, I'm a professor in a big corporate university, um, there are wedges of opportunity. You, you use whatever you can use wherever you are. And so you don't have to sacrifice all of your life's, um, you know, bec- become totally impoverished or cut yourself off from everything. There's a lot you can do from within um, the system if you find yourself partly in it. And there's enormous, while there's a great deal of pain that comes from trying to cut, separate yourself from dependent in, you know, institutions that are bad that you're dependent on, there's also enormous reward that comes from being with people and doing things that make you feel like you're living a more authentic life and one that's better for the planet and better for other people and and so forth. So I think there are a lot of rewards that come from that. It's very hard to do it by yourself, but if you uh, tune into your own most basic, you know, values and and pleasures as well as uh, and needs, uh, as well as to the communities around you that are that are similar. You know, it's not hopeless. There, are, there are still many avenues, most obviously at the local level, but which have to be, you know, scaled up to the global level that um, allow us to to move beyond this terrible, crushing, sociopathic uh, conditions that we're we're imposing on each other and on the planet. 
So thank you so much for that, and thank you for all your work. And I would like to thank people for listening. My guest today has been Charles Derber. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.